Coming up on 2020 on ID. A wife dead. Her husband says it was a tragic fall. But is he a grieving widower or a money-hungry manipulator committed to murder? This man has killed my mama. A suspicious family reeling from grief. I am desperate for someone to give me an answer. And out to learn the truth about this convicted felon with a trail of angry ex-wives. Wife number three. I felt like I was being poisoned. Wife number four. I'll be honest with you, if something happens to me, he needs to be investigated. And wife number one, choking on a throat lozenge? Now another wife dead, and she left clues behind. We turned that house upside down. We were digging, digging. Her hidden journals. Nothing but take, take, take. Police recordings. Do you remember her following? And a new wife, number six, just months after wife number five was laid to rest. You want to know whether or not you murdered her? No, I did not. What a grieving family does when there's nothing to go on except sneaking suspicions. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Few things were more important to Shirley Sites than family. Even at 59 years old, she talked to her mother almost every day. So when Michael Wulschlager waltzed into her life, he took on both a new wife and a new family, one fiercely protective of a woman with a sizable fortune and an even bigger heart. Then, when Shirley was found dead in her bedroom, that family's nagging suspicions turned into outright accusations. Was she the victim of an accident or something more sinister? In 2013, Jim Avila first sorted through the clues and brought us the story of a troubling death in a small southern town. Down around Mobile, Alabama, near the Gulf of Mexico, a short drive takes you through Loxley, once a sleepy lumber town, today famous for absolutely nothing. But now, on a street called Camelot, in a house that here passes for a castle, there is no bright, shining moment, just a dark mystery of sudden, unexplained death. This interview is with Michael Allen Wolfslager. The husband who is not a suspect. This is in reference to Mr. Wolfslager's wife. The wife who died suddenly. Do you know the cause of death? But was not murdered. Do you remember her father? Unless she was. As she falls back, she's going to strike the floor pretty hard. What do you think really happened, Chester? Man, I hate to say this. I think someone murdered my sister. Shirley Seitz fell for Dr. Mike Wolfsleiter, fell hard and fell fast. How do you do to I do in three months flat? But Shirley wasn't his first bride, or his second, or his third, or even fourth. Shirley was number five. Some would tales to tell about their marriage to Mike, and more importantly, how their marriages ended. To be fair, this was wedding number five for Shirley, too. And up in northern Alabama, Shirley's family, the Thomases, wanted to be happy for her, but they could not. I didn't like him at all. I just have to admit that. Me being a minister, I said to her, are you sure? Shirley's daughter, Sharon, was ready to throw something, and it wasn't rice. Please don't do this, Mama. Don't do this. Please, Mama, don't do this. Oh, me. Whatever their worries about her latest trip to the altar, Shirley's family is more than proud of her higher calling. She was an evangelist in search of a flock, preaching the Bible, spreading the gospel, and singing it too. That's her voice soaring on a recording of her favorite hymn, Amazing Grace. Giving, constantly giving. On this trip, I have learned some of the best organic food there is to eat. She walked into Burger King and the waitress say, that's a pretty necklace. She pulled it off, well, here it is. <laughs> she was the type of person that just gave herself away. We believe in that. that. That's part of our faith. And Shirley was that type of person. Shirley prayed with Dr. Mike the first time they met. He worked much of his life as a chiropractor, adjusting grateful patients' backs in the nearby Florida panhandle, known affectionately as Dr. Michael. 
He was a prominent member of the medical community, smiling handsomely in healthcare ads, in the newspaper, and online. But money trouble plagued the chiropractor like a crooked spine. And his financial problems troubled Shirley's family because one of her husbands, Gene Seitz, had died and left her with his name and a hefty inheritance, a million dollars. Were you worried about her money? Yes, I was worried about her money. He come into her life with the clothes on his back. And he's a doctor. He doesn't have a home, mama. Well, he's in transition. He doesn't have a job, mama. Well, he's a chiropractor. He's going to get a job in Alabama. He come into the marriage with a wore out pickup truck and a bunch of debt. Her engagement ring from Dr. Mike, the wedding rings, the house they lived in, that first big purchase together, the family says Shirley paid it all. Mike seemed to appreciate it. Women from their church later said Michael was a wonderful husband to Shirley. Anything in the world Shirley told him to do, he'd jump up and do it, you know. But who wouldn't? Because he knew his bread was being buttered? Yeah, yeah. You said that, I didn't. And it wasn't just his money problems that bothered Shirley's family. He's a charlatan. He wants to be everything to everybody. And when you were around them, you could talk about scuba diving. You could talk about picking peaches off of a tree. Michael had done it. And Michael had done it. And I think Shirley recognized some of that. Wait a minute, this, this is not true. And she knew that I had this old intuition. Hey, this guy's not real. Still, love, marriage, and pushing the grandkids' baby carriage, Shirley's family made room for Big Mike. And even the doubting Thomases could not guess for better or for worse was about to get a whole lot worse. Four years into the marriage, something is wrong with Shirley. Months later, in a recorded interview obtained by 2020, Dr. Michael would tell investigators Shirley had been ill for weeks, food poisoning, thyroid problems, and to cap it off, a stubborn migraine headache. She gets bad migraines maybe two or three times a year that last three, sometimes four days. Shirley's little brother, Ricky Thomas, her closest sibling who had even grown to like Mike, speaks to her on the phone. And I said, hey, what's going on with you, girl? And she said, I'm just not well. Just pray for me. She was so out of it, she just didn't even want to talk to me. Shirley's mom, Myrtle, and her brother, Junior Thomas, drive five hours south to the house on Camelot to see what was what. I said, come to the door and let her see. She said, I can't get up. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I feel so bad I can't get up. The family says they'd never seen Shirley like this. She had a terrible headache. She was really sick. The family says Mike tells them Shirley might have fallen down these stairs a few days earlier while he was away, knocking down a potted plant. He later tells investigators too. I sat here with her mother and asked her, baby, do you remember falling down those steps because that plant was knocked over and she almost got irritatedly mad at me. And she said, I did not fall. Myrtle and Mike nurse Shirley through the weekend. They try to get her to go to the doctor, but Shirley keeps putting it off. Mike gives her migraine medicine. It seems to do a world of good. And by Sunday night, Shirley is even sitting up, eating, and talking. I said, now, Shirley Faye, you better lay down and go to sleep. We don't want that to start back again. And that's the last words I ever said to her. The next morning, Mike, who said he had been spending his nights on the couch and checking on Shirley through the night, goes into the bedroom once again. And... She wasn't responsive. So I walked over and I turned on the light and her lips were already blue. Mike yells for Myrtle. She's not breathing, call 911. Steve Brannon is a former FBI agent, now a private investigator hired by the Thomas family. He showed us around the house on Camelot. So when Myrtle gets in here, what does she see? She sees Shirley on the floor, by the bed. On the ground. On the ground and Michael uh, beginning CPR. Myrtle knows it's too late. And I said, Mike, Shirley's already gone. Shirley is dead. Precious. She was precious. If I can be a third of the woman that she was, I'm, I'm blessed. I loved her. She was my best friend, Jim. And she didn't deserve what happened to her. At the hospital where Shirley is pronounced dead, a distraught Dr. Mike demands answers. 
first thing Mike said, I'll never forget it. He said, well, I want an autopsy. Mike says he was desperate to know whether he could have prevented Shirley's death. I said, I'm trying to get a handle on what's going on because not only have I lost my wife, but now I don't know whether I could have saved her if I could have gotten her to the doctor. And things are about to get worse for the grieving widower because as they begin to settle the estate, Shirley's family oh, turns on it. Too. Chester is sorting through Shirley's fortune. What's left of it? What happened to her finances? He soaked her dry. <laughs> I, I don't know other way to put it. Still ahead, Dr. Mike gets his answers. An autopsy reveals the cause of death, and it was no migraine. But was it the other M word? Stay with us. It's a southern fried mystery. A one-time millionaire, Shirley Sites, dies suddenly, and what we will soon see may not have been Sweet Home Alabama. Her family suspects foul play everywhere they look. And Dr. Michael Wurstleiker, they're looking at you. He, he just didn't act right. To me, he just didn't act right. You started to have questions about what Absolutely. happened to your Absolutely, I did. The suspicions begin with Dr. Mike's reaction to their surprise visit back when Shirley was sick. Dr. Mike tells investigators in that interview obtained by 2020, he was happy to see his in-laws. I said, boy, this is just a real godsend. I said, Shirley's been sick for the last three days with one of her migraine headaches. And uh, I said, here you are showing up. Shirley's mother, Myrtle, and brother, Junior, say that's not how they remember it. He acted very shocked that we were there and, and asked me, what are you all doing here? The family also wonders about that knocked over flower pot. When we went in, we noticed a flower pot that was laying in the floor. And I, I asked him about that. Mike said it showed Shirley might have fallen down the stairs a few days earlier while he was out of town at a doctor's appointment. He uh, tried to tell us that that uh, she had fallen, I, I guess, down the stairs and knocked this flower pot over, you know, and that's how, how her, what, what was calling her head to hurt, you know. But the family suspects that is a little too convenient. They speculate Mike was staging things to back up a phony story that Shirley had fallen. Thomas family investigator, Steve Brannon. When the mother comes in on Friday, this flower pot that was supposedly knocked over on Wednesday is still knocked over. It's not been set up or cleaned up. It's still there? Yes, two days later. If I turn a flower pot over in my house, I pick it up. I don't let it lay there for two days. Something else bothers Myrtle. Michael's activities in the morning surely die. On the way to the hospital, Myrtle says she told him she noticed a spot, maybe blood, maybe something else, on the bed where Shirley had slept. I said, well, I wonder what that red was on the sheet. He said there wasn't nothing red on that sheet. Whatever it was, the family says Mike was very quick to clean it up. When you got back to the house, did you go looking for the sheet to see what was on it? And what'd you find they out? They's done gone. He'd done jerked them off the bed and had them in the washing machine wash. Dr. Mike later told police Shirley got sick on the bed. Hasty laundering, a knocked over plant, and there was something else. I'm a nurse by profession, and he claims to be a doctor. Uh, now, I know it's chiropractor, and he supposedly has a PhD. He's not a medical doctor, but still, he claims to be a doctor. And he said he'd give her five chest compressions. Well, CPR first aid, you don't give an adult five chest compressions. You give them 30. And that's when I guess it started really going in my head. What has what this man done? Somebody's not acting right. But is this grieving family overreaching to blame someone? We don't like something that's ambiguous. None of us really like that. We want to know why something happened. Psychologist Jennifer Hartstein says in cases like these, it may be the grief talking. And very often, while we're grieving, if we're angry, we might want some sort of retaliation. We think that they must have done it, so we're going to retaliate and go after that person. But buckle up, because the Thomas family is not going to quit. In fact, their hunt for Shirley's will 
leads to a scene straight out of a TV cop show. While Dr. Mike is out at a religious meeting, the family conducts a frantic, clandestine search of the house. Mike could have come back through that door at any minute. So we was having to kind of sneak around and do what we had to do with one eye here and one eye there. Sharon and her uncle Ricky Thomas take the place apart, drawer by drawer. We turned that house upside down. We were digging, digging, taking pictures, trying to find that original wheel to get in my hand. The family knew that Mike had received $100,000 from her life insurance policy. But when they find the will, they discover Shirley, even after four years of marriage, left everything to her daughters, not a dime to her husband. Why didn't she write him in? To the family, the answer becomes clear when they find something else. Shirley's journals, personal, revealing journals. We found it in actually up underneath another drawer in her bedroom. Is there anything of interest in the journals about their relationship? Uh, how much longer am I going to have to financially support this man? He said he wasn't going to do this to me. He was going to get a job. He's constantly spending my money. Lord, when is he going to get a job? Later, when police ask Mike about his marriage, he paints a totally different picture. How would you describe your, your and Sheriff's relationship? We had an absolutely marvelous relationship. Shirley and I were the epitome of just exactly what a husband and wife are supposed to be. But when Shirley's daughter reads some of the journal entries to 2020, well, see what you think about this marvelous relationship. I'm so hurt and disappointed with Michael that I really don't want to be around him. I'm angry at him and let down. Nothing but take, take, take from this man. No giving. I'm not a wife, I'm a bank that is taking care of all of his financial needs. But did Shirley know just how much she was supporting her husband? He took $100,000 out of her check account 30 days before she died. Or 33 days, I think, before she died. Do you know what happened to that money? I know who it was wrote to. The check was wrote to a, a, a company that he owns. Clues to an unhappy marriage, but no smoking gun. But just to be clear, her complaints about him were mostly about financial. Financial, yes. There, I never saw any communications in regards of him being physically mean to her, just financially. And she wasn't frightened of him? No, she didn't make you know, indication that she was scared of him in the journals, no. So Shirley's family turns their investigation in another direction. Mike's long matrimonial history and comes across the odd tale of wife number one. Her name is Lynn. I said, Ricky, I need to tell you some things I found out about Michael. The family had discovered what is to them a very strange coincidence. Shirley's daughter, Sharon, arranged to meet her uncle, Ricky, to tell him about it. I knew that it would be upsetting, so I just asked Ricky, let's just ride up to the cemetery. They come here to, of all places, the High Rock Cemetery, where they had buried Shirley less than two weeks before. Right beside Shirley's grave. Among the shadows of the tombstones, it's an oddly comforting place where they can feel Shirley's presence and where Sharon can broach a difficult subject with the one family member still close to Mike. She shows Ricky an old yellowing newspaper article, a brief story about the sudden death of a young woman in Gainesville, Florida in 1977. Lynn Wolfslager, Mike's first wife, the article says a 25-year-old woman apparently choked to death Friday on a throat lozenge. Choked to death on a sepical lozenge. That's what her death certificate says. It appears there was no police investigation. Sharon and the rest of the Thomas family say they find two things strange about that. First, an otherwise healthy 25-year-old woman chokes to death on a cough drop. Second, they say Michael had always told them a different story. He told them his first wife didn't die suddenly. She died a slow, painful death from cancer. Michael had told us the entire time that he was married to Mama that Lynn had leukemia. And that's how she died? Yes, that's how she died. And that when she died, he was holding her hand, consoling her in the bed. He never mentioned a throat no. lozenge. Mm -mm. It made me wonder, well, what else has he lied about? What else has he lied about? For the answer to that question, we take you to Chipley, Florida, 
and a suspicious fire in Dr. Mike's past, nearly 20 years ago. I was approaching this place of business here. I detected smokes, seen smoke. Lieutenant Tillman Mears, in plain clothes now, was a rookie patrolman back in the day. He says Dr. Michael, as everyone called him, was the go-to chiropractor in town, especially for female patients. One night, his office caught fire. The doctor was found standing across the street, just watching it burn. My first question was, why didn't the doctor call the fire department? Instead, he tells an incredible story. Someone trying to kill him set the fire while he was trapped inside. He said he woke up smelling smoke and had to fight his way out of the burning building. Escaping by karate kicking through a burning wall barefoot, but when police check his feet, there's no burns, not even a scratch. Mears says the skillful chiropractor was twisting the truth. He thought I was gonna go away, I think, and believe what he said. But the cops say Dr. Mike's story stunk, and so did he. Once I approached Mr. Washington Leggard, I detected the smell of diesel fuel on his person. And that was before they found the can of diesel fuel and a match and the suspected motive. He was flat broke and after the insurance. Dr. Wolfslager was arrested, tried, and convicted of arson. And one thing stayed with the policeman after all these years. He says Dr. Mike threatened him. After the jury had come back with a guilty verdict, he turned and told me that I'd pay for this. Dr. Mike was the one who paid, although he got no prison time, just 15 years probation. And with the surrender of his license, it was the end of his career as a chiropractor. But for Shirley's family, it was evidence of much more. Dr. Mike, when he is broke, they say, is not above committing a crime or inventing a whopper of a story to cover his tracks. Who had the motive? Who had the opportunity? Who has lied in the past? Trying to answer that question, we contacted Mike's second wife, Paula. She says he never harmed her. Even so, as you've seen, he's no choir boy. In fact, he's a convicted criminal but capable of killing? Who says? She does. The other ex-wives are now coming out of the woodwork with startling stories of their own. All of a sudden. Bam to the back of the head. You just feel this blunt impact. Just bam. Stay with us. In broad daylight, in the middle of the night, there are a million ways to die, but the criminal justice system really only concerns itself with one, homicide. That's what the Thomas family of Alabama suspects happened in the mystifying death of Shirley Sites. They accuse Shirley's husband, Dr. Mike Wolfsleich. I intend to see that he's dealt with and he can take that to the bank. A flicker of suspicion about what happened in the house on Camelot Court is now a raging five-alarm mission for what they see as justice that has fully engulfed three generations of the Thomas family and leads to two more of Dr. Mike's five wives. So I just get on the internet and start Facebooking. Relentless, Sharon has tracked down yet another wife, Number three, Gloria Potts. I said, well, I would like to talk to her. I, I just want to find out who is this person that we thought we knew. Gloria says she knows things about Dr. Mike. Hey. Give me a hug. 2020 was there when Gloria met Shirley's family face to face for the first time. <laughs> what could have been the most awkward family reunion ever. Relatives of the fifth wife meeting the third wife. It's the Dr. Mike ex-wives club bonding over their shared suspicions. It's so good to meet all of y'all. Absolutely. Nice to be nice able to nice. let y'all know how I feel. And I'm so sorry. Thank you. Of course, Mike is missing, and so is Shirley. I bring back a lot of memories. I'm so sorry. I didn't know Shirley, but it was almost like I had lost someone. Gloria spoke with Sharon by phone soon after Shirley's death. She can remember the charming side of Dr. Mike. There is something that attracts women to it, right? Yes. Very polite. Always polite. Always opens your door. Just very caring. And some of my, my friends, when we were dating, would say, 
there's something wrong. Nobody's that nice. And she now says they were right. Toward the end of their marriage, Gloria believes Michael was trying to poison her. I felt like I was being poisoned. Hmm. I, I, I really did. Uh, you got sick? Sick, couldn't hardly move. And then that's when I turned around and told her, Gloria, I can't believe you're saying this to me, but I said, Mother has had these same symptoms. The family of wife number five, Shirley, wondered if Dr. Mike had been trying to poison her too. And you guessed it, here comes Mrs. Wolfschlager number four, Diana. Today's date is February the 4th, 2011. In a recording obtained by 2020, investigators questioned Diana Yohn, the fourth stop on Dr. Mike's matrimonial trail, the wife between Gloria and Shirley. I think the man's dangerous, personally. Do you think that he's capable of murder? She has no proof, but Diana tells police toward the end of their marriage, when she had a $250,000 life insurance policy, she suspects Dr. Mike may have been trying to poison her, too. You think that he may have been giving you some type of medication, but you're actually not sure of that. Yeah, I mean, it just seems my headaches were so bad, and I get migraine headaches, okay, and it's documented that I do, but they were so bad when I lived with him, I, I couldn't even work, I couldn't hardly function end of her interview, Mike's ex-wife makes a chilling request. And I'll be honest with you, if something happens to me, he needs to be investigated. So now two more wives suspect Dr. Mike was trying to poison them. And one of them says, hold on, that's not all. Wife number three, Gloria, reveals a terrible trauma she says happened in her marriage nearly 30 years ago. She says Dr. Mike, the man who had always killed her with kindness, tried to kill her with a mallet. And I was asleep, and he hit me in the back of the head with hit a mallet. With a mallet? Yes. And uh, all of a sudden, the pillow went over my face. And his hand came under the pillow and covered my nose and my mouth. Gloria says she escaped by playing dead and then running out of the house. I was hysterical, crying and upset. And when I would try to yell for help, I'd go, and had no voice. You went to the hospital? I went to the hospital, but we told them I slipped in the tub. Did you ever ask him at any point, why were you doing that? Why did you try to kill me? Yes. He told me he had gotten stung by jellyfish when he worked in China and that it was a reaction to the toxins. That's right. She says Dr. Mike's excuse for hitting her over the head with a mallet, the jellyfish made him do it. Had there been an argument or something? No. It was just this one time just this one time he, he snapped gloria says she told no one not even the police sticking to the story of slipping in the tub until she and mike divorced about 10 years later only then she says did she begin telling people she also got a restraining order so people are going to wonder okay so so you get hit over the head and the guy puts a pillow over your head and yet you didn't divorce him right then you stayed yes have you asked yourself why a million times, I can't understand why. I have no answer to that question. I'm sorry that I didn't call you. That's okay. That's okay. I really should have called her. That's okay. Yeah. She says she had two children to think of, and aside from the one incident, Mike was never violent. Anyone that was around Michael would know it's out of character. He was very charismatic, very calm, very nurturing, just total opposite. Of, of what you'd think. Were you scared of him after that? Yes. Must have been hard to go to sleep next to the same man. Yes, it was. But besides the fact that he hit you with a mallet, he was a good husband. Other than trying to kill me, to my knowledge, he was a very good husband. It, it doesn't make sense. And me staying didn't make sense. Maybe she's just mad. Maybe she is trying to get back at him. Possibly. That's, that's the possibility, but she's been telling the same story for a number of years. It, it didn't just come up after Shirley died. Can you still see him standing over you? Yes. And I was, I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. Now remember when Gloria told the family and then police this amazing tale of Mike's alleged attack, no one knew what killed Shirley. 
the autopsy was not finished yet. So imagine the reaction when months later, the family is finally given the results. I'm shaking my head. I can't believe this. I cannot believe this. I can't believe this is happening. Why? Because the medical examiner finds what caused Shirley's death is no migraine. It's a blow to the head, blunt force head injuries, a hit to the back of Shirley's skull hard. That is what killed her. So when you find out later on that it's oh, blunt force trauma to the head. The, then, then there's no question in my mind that Michael uh, murdered this woman, murdered Shirley. My mother has actually been killed. This man has killed my mama. But not so fast. The toxicology report found no poison or fatal doses of drugs. And even as it makes clear the cause of death, the autopsy fails to answer the really big question, the manner of death. How Shirley got that fatal injury? The medical examiner writes simply, undetermined. Accident? Homicide? Can't really tell. Still ahead, is this case so complicated, only a dummy can solve it? Stay with us. The autopsy on Shirley Seitz has been released. Her family had believed it would prove she was murdered, but they were sorely disappointed. Shirley did die of blunt force trauma, but the question remained, how? Once again, Jim Avila. It is a deadly game of 20 questions. Perhaps first, does this stairway lead to accidental death? Or as the family of Shirley Seitz believes, is it a fatal spiral to foul play? My theory is that my sister did not fall downstairs. Three people go to sleep in this house on a winter night in Alabama. Only two wake up. The husband, Dr. Mike, says maybe his wife fell down the stairs a few days earlier. But no one, not him, nor her mother who was there, saw or for that matter heard Shirley Seitz die. So what happened? No better words, slam my sister's head against a wooden floor or against something hard, fractured the occipital bone in the back of her head, dislocated her brain from the front of her head, and she died from the results of it. So is that possible? We summon two top experts. In the field of forensics, a medical examiner. In the field of falling down, a dummy. Dr. Bill Mannion, a private medical examiner from New Jersey, has conducted thousands of autopsies. Very difficult. I mean, this is the, the kind of case that exasperates pathologists because we, we can hear all kinds of hearsay and complaints of family members, but again, to go into court and say beyond a reasonable doubt that this is a homicide, it would be very, very difficult. We asked him to review Shirley's case. His most important finding, Dr. Mannion says in his opinion, the autopsy shows Shirley certainly did not die days after falling down the stairs. As Dr. Mike suggests, she died within hours. Do you believe she'd be able to carry on a conversation? Sit up, no, a couple days later, talk with her mother, sitting on a couch. Forensic pathologists thought this was an acute injury and she died within an hour or two of this injury. That's my read on the autopsy. Not days later. Not days later, that's correct. But does that mean Shirley was murdered? Not necessarily. We took Dr. Mannion to a house with a carpet-covered staircase like the one where Shirley lived. An important point, Shirley had only one serious injury, the blow to her head, no bruises on her back or buttocks. So a full fall down the stairs like this is highly unlikely. It's not consistent with falling all the way down the stairs. That's correct. I would expect her to have, more, to have more injuries if she fell down a flight of stairs. In fact, Dr. Mannion says the only fall on the steps that makes any sense is if she tripped at the bottom of the stairs. And as she fall back, falls back, she strikes her head on the edge of the step. And by doing that, she sustains all the skull fractures to the back of the head. Now, there is at least one scenario in which the autopsy and the family's theory could match here in the bedroom. In a homicide scenario, you could just lift, lift the person up and then slam them right back on the ground. But Dr. Mannion has serious reservations. For one thing, Shirley could have fallen accidentally in the bedroom. And also, 
Could Shirley have been murdered with her mother right there in the house? We don't hear any boom. We don't hear any commotion. The, the mother is there. She doesn't hear any screaming. There's no defensive wounds. There's no signs of a struggle. So again, very, very difficult to say this is a homicide. In the end, our medical examiner expert, Dr. Mannion, says the autopsy does not have all the answers in this case. This is the kind of case where you need help from the police. But there was an investigation by Loxley Police and the Alabama Bureau of Investigation. It went on for a year and resulted in a 184-page report to the prosecutor, although Shirley's family doesn't think much of it. I think it's a joke. I think my 10-year-old grandson could have done a better investigation than the ABI done or the Loxley Police Department. For one thing, the Thomas family feels agents went way too easy when they interviewed Dr. Mike. Do you have any suspicions as to what may have happened to her? The only thing I can rationalize based on the way she was feeling and what the autopsy report said was she had to slip down the steps and hit her head. The police do ask Mike whether he might have accidentally done something to Shirley. And you're, you're a chiropractor, right? Yes. You say you worked on your wife quite yes. a bit. You think something may have happened when you, you were adjusting her or something? Or? I've adjusted thousands upon thousands of people, and I've never had, I mean, my entire career, I never had any malpractice suits, never had any injuries other than a couple of broken ribs on some old ladies. When the ABI ended its investigation, the county prosecutor took no action. The Thomas family is furious. Why has nothing happened? It's because someone does not want to do their job. They have proven to me, I'm talking about the Baldwin County District Attorney's Office, that they do not want to work hard on this case. They hire Birmingham attorney Henry Frozen. In nearly two years after Shirley's death, they sued Dr. Mike. The lawsuit alleges the deceased was killed through the actions, or by the actions, of Michael Walshlein. Answering the suit, Dr. Mike flatly denies having a hand in Shirley's death. But he didn't even need to bother. That's because the lawsuit was dead on arrival. There was one factor that we did not know and didn't appreciate. It turns out that back when Shirley's daughters settled her estate, they had agreed not to sue Mike. And sure enough, the judge threw out the lawsuit, leaving any legal action in the hands of the criminal justice system. Still ahead, an unscheduled appointment with Dr. Mike. You won't want to miss. I just want to know whether or not you murdered Shirley. And be sure to RSVP, you're about to meet wife number six. Stay with us. Shirley Seitz is at peace. She's home now in the family plot in Blunt County, Alabama, but her family cannot rest. Are you feeling a little frustrated about the fact that Dr. Mike is still free? Yes, absolutely. He's living his life. He's going on with his life. He's moved on like nothing's ever happened. I believe, and I'll go to my grave believing that sometime between midnight and seven o'clock, he went in that bedroom and took her life. We tried to make an appointment to see Dr. Wolfslager, to ask him about his terrible luck, about how and why two of his wives had died early, sudden deaths, and two others suspect he tried to poison them. But the doctor wouldn't see us, turned down our request for an interview. So we went to see him. We found him living in Pensacola, Florida, and not alone. We Dr. Mike, just, here, Dr. Mike you you the woman with him and threatening to sue as I backpedal used to be known as Luann Elkins. She'd known Dr. Mike back when Shirley was still alive. The question is, just how well? I do believe that he was having an affair on Mother. The woman that he is now married to, I believe, is the woman that he was seeing um, prior to Mother's death. Married to? That's right. Luann now goes by the name Maggie. Maggie Wolschlager. She is wife number six. Are you currently in a relationship with anybody else now? Or? I go out with people just to be with them. Her name had come up in Dr. Mike's interview three months after Shirley's death when police asked about his love life. I've been to the movies with Luann and I've actually babysat at Luann's two sons 
not really dating dating i mean okay. I, I i i see well, I, I, none of none of them are are dates per se no no dr mike denied the police that he cheated on shirley but sharon says she believes it could be another motive for wanting shirley out of the way there's too many red flags with what I have discovered in reference to her. We found Dr. Mike in a fast food parking lot. Wife number six was not happy to see us, but we did get to ask that critical question. Get in the car. We just want to know whether or not you murdered Shirley. That's all we want to do. Yeah. All we We're going to ask, sue you. you murder Shirley? No, I did not. Let me ask you, Myrtle, as a mom, what are you looking for here? I guess justice. I don't want to accuse somebody of something that they didn't do. But then if, some, if he did do something to my daughter, uh, well, uh, I'd need him to have to pay for it. When Shirley married this man, she had half a million dollars in liquid assets plus a home and 15 acres of land. And what happened to your sister when the money ran out? What happened to her? She died. Wuschlager says he now has no money, is living on food stamps, and can't afford a lawyer. Although he may need one again, the Thomas family at long last got some good news. They say the Alabama Attorney General, Luther Strange, has reopened the case. The family hoping this painful game of 20 questions is nearly over. I am desperate for someone to answer those questions and give me an answer. The Thomases believe this case should not linger, not just for Shirley's sake, but out of a new concern, a concern for Mike's new wife. In fact, Ricky says he's called to warn her. I just didn't feel like I could could rest without at least telling her. And she got very defensive, and I said, hey, that's, that's okay. I'm just tr calling you to warn you because I wish somebody had a warned my sister. We've had a good trip, good trip. The family says Mike may have replaced Shirley, but they cannot. It has been a long road. Mother was was my best friend she uh, she was just close to me and it it does hurt um, when I can't leave work and call her or when I can't tell her hey guess what your grandbaby did today um, so it, it's it hurts I'm ready for closure we I think we all are we're ready for closure Anytime he needs to remember, little brother Ricky drives up to that quiet spot in High Rock and listens for the sound he's been missing, his big sister's voice. Oh,